On April 1, 1981, the Space Shuttle, formerly known as the Space Transportation System, or STS for short, took to the skies for the first time. STS was designed to be the spacecraft of the future, a reusable spacecraft capable of carrying large payloads to low Earth orbit for less money than pre-existing rockets. NASA and the Department of Defense, who supported the program, had so much faith in STS that they got Congress to make a law that designated STS the primary launch vehicle for all U.S. payloads. STS consisted of three major components. The orbiter was a large reusable space plane capable of carrying payloads up to 25 tons in a large 60 by 15 foot bay. It also had a robotic arm that could be used to grab onto payloads. Most importantly, the orbiter could carry a crew up to seven people. The external tank contained almost all the fuel that STS used to get to space. The ET fed its fuel to three large RS-25 rocket engines located on the orbiter. The ET was not reused and burnt up in the atmosphere in the, over the Indian Ocean. The solid rocket boosters provided the initial kick to get STS off the pad and into space. Manufactured in Utah and shipped in segments by rail to Florida, the SRBs were another reusable component of STS. After separating from the rest of the stack, the SRBs would re-enter and parachute down to the ocean, before being taken back to land to be refurbished and reused. The VAB, the crawler transporter, the mobile launcher, and dozens of other Apollo-era structures and equipment were modified to support STS. In addition, facilities for building and testing various STS components were also built. Despite STS legally being the default launch vehicle for all U.S. payloads, NASA and the DOD decided that another launch vehicle should be developed as sort of a shuttle backup. The rocket would be designed for the commercial market and would need to be able to place over 10 tons of payload into a geostationary transfer orbit. The bid went out in 1984 and there were three major competitors. Martin Marietta bid the Titan 34D-7 rocket, which was an upgraded Titan III rocket which stretched first and second stages and more powerful UA-11206 solid rocket motors. Lockheed bid a version of their Atlas rocket that would use an upgraded version of the proven Centaur upper stage, which itself was manufactured by Convair. Boeing studied a design that many have called the single worst shuttle-derived launcher ever proposed, a design that many used as many STS components as possible in order to keep costs down, a design that didn't even use any components made by Boeing. It was called SRBX. The first stage of SRBX were two four-segment solid rocket boosters, almost completely identical to those used on the space shuttle, meaning they could be reused. Since the rocket planned to use the same mobile launcher as STS, the width between the two SRBs on SRBX need to be the same on STS. This gives SRBX its signature and much mocked look. The primary disadvantage of this would be the added structural weight on the rocket. SRBX would also use many of the same facilities as STS, such as the high bay and the VAB. Just like those on STS, the, S the SRBs would be manufactured by Thiokol Corporation in Utah and transported by rail to either of the two planned launch sites, Kennedy Space Center in Florida or Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The second stage of SRBX was a three-segment SRB that would be air-started once the first stage SRBs burnt out. One of the main criticisms of the SRBX launch vehicle is a lack of engine out capability due to the fact that once an SRB is lit, it cannot be turned off. Additionally, some claim that the stress of the air starting of the SRBs would rip the vehicle apart, or at least cause major structural damage. This SRB would not be recovered. Just like all other SRBs, this would be manufactured by Thiokol and transported by rail. The third stage of SRBX was not actually a reused component from STS. It was an upper stage from the Titan 3D rocket. The Titan 3D was used to launch KH-9 and KH-11 spy satellites for the U.S. Air Force between 1971 and 1982. The stages themselves were manufactured by Martin Marietta. Other proposed variants of SRBX proposed using the Titan UA-11205 boosters as the first stage and the Titan 3 first stage as the second stage. The fairing for SRBX was 15 by 69 feet, making it capable of carrying almost all payloads launched from STS.
The fourth and final stage of SRBX was another planned component of STS. The Centaur-G and Centaur-G Prime were stages designed to be placed with their payload inside the Space Shuttle Orbiter's cargo bay. This would allow STS to broaden the types of payloads it could launch, since the Centaur stages would greatly expand the types of orbits payloads could be launched in. The project was a joint NASA Department of Defense program, and the stages themselves were to be manufactured by General Dynamics. Payloads planned to be launched include the Galileo and Ulysses probes to Jupiter, the Magellan probes to Venus, and the Milstar satellites for the U.S. Air Force. Centaur-G and Centaur-G Prime were canceled after the Challenger disaster, only a few months before their first scheduled flight. Payloads planned to be launched using the Shuttle Centaur system were later launched using the less powerful inertial upper stage. A single Centaur-G Prime was built and is now on display at NASA's Glenn Research Center. SRBX could use both the Centaur-G or Centaur-G Prime stages. My version of SRBX uses the Centaur-G Prime. One of the main design aspects of SRBX was the reuse of the SRBs. As has been stated by people like Elon Musk and Tori Bruno, and has been demonstrated by the Falcon 9, reusability only makes sense if the launch vehicle has a high rate of flight. The reuse of the SRBs on STS, and indeed the entirety of STS, was not economical, because it never achieved the high rate of flight that the program had initially planned for. If SRBX had a launch rate similar to Falcon 9, the reuse of the SRBs would have been justified. Even if this did not occur, then the reuse still might have been justified since the SRBs used on SRBX could also be reused on STS and vice versa. The SRBs would follow the same recovery, processing, and reusability procedures on those on STS and would use the same facility. Due to both the limitations of the game and my own design, my SRBs differ from the IRL SRBs in several ways, including the descent profile and the number of parachutes. However, they are close enough for me to be okay with them. So, was SRBX the single worst shuttle-derived launcher ever proposed? Depends on how you look at it. Every launch vehicle has its advantages and disadvantages. But in the defense of SRBX, it was proposed in a pre-Challenger disaster world, where it looked like STS would be able to deliver on all of its promises. The semi-reusable shuttle-derived launch vehicle able to supplement STS launches sounded quite good in 1984. It's easy to say that SRBX was a bad design when we have nearly 30 years of hindsight. The proposed first launch date of 1988 for SRBX in all likelihood would have been pushed back by a few years, and who knows what the Challenger disaster would have done to the SRBX program if it was approved. Clearly, NASA and the DoD didn't think that SRBX was a good design, since in 1985, they chose a th Titan 34D-7 as the winning bidder. Other proposed SRB-centric launch vehicles, even those that entered development, like Ares-1 and Omega, never got off the launch pad. So, uh, what do you think? I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. Concepts for the future of new rocket design.